fight to free our nations. Palestine and Ferguson in the occupation. Ferguson and Palestine, we fight to save our nation. Recovering or is the economy itself the problem? Today on the show, Marxist philosopher David Harvey on what he calls money, the great corrupter. And later, a meeting of movements as activists from Black Lives Matter travel to Palestine. All that and a few thoughts from me on Greek charisma. It's all coming up. Charisma. It's all coming up. long believed that few things in the world were less well understood than the U.S. economy. In our global media, the U.S. is still seen largely as an overwhelmingly affluent and successful place. Even if there are pockets of poverty, they're usually explained by race or gender or people not just trying hard enough. David Harvey has a very different take. Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, Harvey believes it's not a few personal problems or pockets, it's the system that's the problem. And it's in much worse shape in the US and globally than you might think. Professor Harvey is out with a new book, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. And I'm happy to say he's come in to discuss it. Glad to have you, David. Thank you. Growth is one of your crises, one of your contradictions rather, yeah. that you talk about in the book. There are several others that seem rather urgent um, want to talk about those? I think the the ones that uh, to me are, are are most significant are are the growth issue, the environmental issue, and what I call universal alienation. Um, the The way in which we relate to each other, the way in which we relate to our jobs, the way in which we relate to the natural world around us, uh, is being constructed in a certain way through the dynamics of technological change and through the growth process to the point where it's almost impossible to be really human mm. <laughs> in, in, in our relationships uh, to people, in our relationships to, to life. And I think that there's a kind of sense of frustration, a tremendous sense of frustration. Uh, and you see this in a younger generation that looks at the future and says, where are the meaningful jobs? Uh, it's not only jobs. I mean, I get very tired when politicians go around and say, jobs, 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 jobs. You say, but, yeah, but meaningful jobs. Right. A lot of the jobs right now, you know, and uh, back in the in say the 1960s when I first came to the United States, uh, the biggest employers were people like U.S. Steel, uh, auto industry, and so on. And if you talk to a steel worker, they were they were kind of political and uh, saw they were being exploited, but they had a certain sense of dignity in terms of the work they did and certain pride in it. The biggest employers now are no longer of that sort. They are Walmart, McDonald's, uh, you know, and, and the rest of it. And you talk to people who are employed in that and say, do you feel this is dignified work? And they'll look at you and laugh. Okay. And about 70% of the population of the United States is either totally uh, upset at the nature of the work it has to do or totally indifferent to it. Mm. And this is kind of a situation in which uh, uh, you get uh, a kind of visceral anger. And what we've seen, by the way, over the last 20 or 30 years are these sudden outbreaks of visceral anger. Uh, in London, for example, suddenly the whole thing, is, you know, yeah. burnings go on. We saw it last, uh, last year in Stockholm. We saw it in Gezi Park in Istanbul. We've seen these events in North Africa. In Brazil, millions of people out on the street complaining about the World Cup of soccer. I mean, what were they? Well, they're, 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 they're angry and alienated that somehow or other they cannot have a meaningful life and a decent uh, living environment uh, with decent employment opportunities. And, and, and so this, this sense of alienation is producing, at this point, not an alternative political mm -hmm. movement, but outbreaks of fury and anger. Uh, which are actually very, very difficult to predict and very, very difficult to control. What did we have before we had commercialization and capitalization and alienation of ourselves from our labor and each other? Well, I think the, there was this period uh, during the 1930s, 1940s, and I don't think we should romanticize it, but there, there was this, this period where labor felt, I think, it was able to 
have a piece of the pie mm -hmm. and, and could influence things. And there was a social, net, you know, a social safety net which was being constructed, a welfare state of sorts, which had a class character and had all kinds of things wrong with it. I mean, it, relationship to, to gender and race was absolutely awful and, 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 and so on. But, but nevertheless, there was a kind of sense that the, there was a, uh, the possibility of a, of a better future, and people felt that. And then in the 1970s, all of that began to get eroded and just gradually washed away. And there was a time when people felt, well, being entrepreneurial is a good idea. We can all go out and be entrepreneurs and so on. And of course, some people did and they made it, but a lot of people didn't. And increasingly, we got the, 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 the production of more and more higher and higher levels of poverty. Uh, the, the income inequalities start to sort of spiral out of hand. And so we get, we get this, 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 trans, this transformation. And, and uh, then it produces, through the technological changes, the artificial intelligence, the robotization, and all the rest of it, then what we get is this kind of meaningless labor where people don't really understand what it is they're doing. Uh, a society which, by the way, is, is, is dedicated to be anti-government, but which is more bureaucratic <laughs> than ever before. I mean, I work in a university. The levels of bureaucratic stuff <laughs> we have to fill out to do anything is just enormous. And, and so, you know, we've got this system where I think that, 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 that it's not working at any level. And it's wrong in the fundamentals. I mean, in your book, you quote the wonderful Karl Polanyi, and you just use the word transformation. Yes. He goes further back. He says that the fundamentals are wrong. Yes. Our relationship to land, to labor, to capital yes. is in itself wrong. Yes. What did he add to the, to the Marxist picture? Well, he, I don't know whether he added anything. I mean, I like Karl Polanyi precisely because he doesn't come out of the Marxist camp, uh -huh. but it, it, I think so much of what Marx talked about and Polanyi talks about is just common sense. Land is not a commodity that we've made. We've turned it into a commodity by establishing private property rights, and we're doing things on that sort with knowledge now. So knowledge, which should be a commons for everybody, is now being enclosed and, and, and actually... I, I had to, I, you know, I was stuck somewhere and I needed one of my own articles and I couldn't find a copy of it. I was traveling and I had to pay $25 in order to get it off the web. And I thought, here I am paying $25 for one of my own articles. This is ridiculous. The cloud is not the commons. No, it's not the commons. And so there's this, so, so there's this privatization of everything which has actually enclosed things and, 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 and I think it's increasingly done so. And of course what Polanyi is about is saying when land got, enclosed that way. When labor, which is not a commodity either, gets commodified, uh, and, and, and when capital is, is, is also becomes a commodity which you can charge interest uh, on, then, then this is a wacky world. It's a fictitious world. And, and so capital has always been built on certain fictions. But now those fictions are coming home to roost, I think, and we saw those fictions really go haywire entirely in 2007, 2008. If, though, to continue this for just a bit before we get back to the crisis, if, as you write and others have written, that in fact we have lost our community, that community has become commodities and, and money and exchange. You have a great line from Marx, oh, I think, yes, about yes. money has become the only community. Um, how do we undo it? How do we, oh, do we want to go back, forward, what? No, we don't want to go back. Uh, we want to really start to think about how to go forward. Uh, and there are a lot of experiments going on right now of trying to say, all right, look, uh, the social relations are, are terrible. Let's try and set up a solidarity economy. Let's try to set up uh, uh, worker cooperatives. Let's uh, do what the Argentinians are doing, which is create uh, recuperated factories, take over the factories for ourselves do those kinds of things. So, so there, are, there, are, there are people, and, and you know, and there's of course there's a lot of argument going on about how to relate to the deep ecology movement and so on. Now, I don't necessarily think these are great movements in the sense that they, they head in a, a real coherent political direction. But what it says is that in a, in a world where there's mass alienation from our relation to nature and relation to others, we're going to see responses which are not only outbreaks of fury and anger at the nature of the system, but also start to become, well, maybe locally you and I could sit down and start to construct something which is an alternative. So we're seeing a lot of that going on at various parts of the world. And in some cases, um, these experiments, I think, are actually sort of uh, suggesting uh, ways, uh, ways to go. So we'll see, we see 
uh, for instance, in various areas of Latin America, the Bolivarian revolutions going on, and, and there's a lot wrong with, with, with it, but on the other hand, at least people are trying to find out new ways of relating. And they talk now, uh, for instance, about this idea of buen vivir, of good living, and that the idea of an economy is to create good living for everybody rather than to maximize yeah. GDP. And uh, this is a kind of, I think, a significant shift in the mentality of how we approach uh, questions of development and how we approach questions of uh, reconstruction of urban and rural life. Is it true amongst your students that you're finding a greater appetite for these conversations? And is the word capitalism and socialism, are those words being used? Oh, yes. There's a, there's a, well, amongst my students anyway, there's a good deal of criticism of capitalism. Uh, there's a good deal of, uh, I think, uh, interest in, in uh, uh, what might be called autonomous forms of organizing. So uh, there's a great deal of suspicion of political parties. There's a great deal of suspicion about uh, any appeal to state power or, and the like. But there are these uh, sort of movements, uh, I think, which uh, I, I think it's wrong to call them anarchists because they're not. I mean, some of it is, but, but it's, it's more about uh, trying to create uh, more sort of local democracy, local democratic uh, decision-making structures. And I think this is a very, very healthy uh, phase of innovation at that level. The big, big problem for me is how do we actually turn it into something which is much uh, greater. And there, there is a very significant barrier, which is that you know, to the degree that, uh, for instance, the unions are no longer as strong as they are, and uh, you like, you say, well, where are the main centers of political organization right now, which are, quote, oppositional? And it's mainly, of course, through uh, the, the non-governmental organizations. And uh, non-governmental organizations are not revolutionary. Yeah. Non-governmental organizations address qu questions of, I don't know, poverty or environment or something of that uh, at a certain kind of scale. But they don't challenge the nature of the general order because the general order is what funds them. So that we've got a sort of situation right now in which the main political institutions through opposition expressed are not actually able uh, to mount a challenge uh, to the hegemonic and dominant forms of power which are currently ruling the world. Well, I did appreciate at the end of your 17 contradictions, you did have 17 suggestions, or maybe you called them mandates, I don't remember. Yeah, right. um, do you want, a num want, to, you want to articulate a few of those? Because you do lay out some yeah. clear suggestions. Well, I think, I think it's, very, it's very, I mean, for instance, the first contradiction I deal with is a distinction between use value and exchange value. And I use the example of housing. Housing has a use value and it has an exchange value. And of course, there's a certain tension. If you want to maximize the exchange value, you make them lose the use value. Now, we've been told that the best way in which to get the use values delivered to the mass of the population is to invent an exchange value structure. Uh, which allows mortgage financing and, 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 and all, you know, all kinds of things of that sort, private home ownership and, and all the rest of it, a whole structure of a uh, of commodified uh, world, uh, which uh, is very profitable for those people who are running it. So they, they get a profit, and we supposedly get the use values of the housing. Well, what we saw in the housing crisis was, I don't know, six million people lost their That's use right. values. And I'm kind of going, well, what we should be doing is thinking about a society that delivers use values to people directly and doesn't have to go through this intermediary of the exchange value system from which a great deal of wealth is being extracted by small groups of people. And the same thing applies to education. Same thing applies to health care. It's a use value. It's useful. It should be there. Education should be useful, should be there. We should keep the exchange value dynamic out of it. So my suggestion is to everybody, maximize uh, the use value provision character of mm -hmm. the society and think about how to organize the provision of those use values uh, and minimize the capacity of people to, pr to extract private wealth from an exchange value system which occasionally blows up like it did in 2007, 2008 with disastrous consequences. But is that different from the social welfare system that you grew up in in the UK? Well, there was, the, yes, I think the nationalization education. of health care and education. I, my education was free right the way through and I had free health care. And I think uh, that, that should be the case. Uh, and of course, that gets eroded. Now, one of the difficulties, however, with something like the National Health Service in Britain uh, was it, while it was nationalized and, and in terms of what it was providing to people, it was preyed upon by a lot of private corporations. So there's a, there's a kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's always this awkward thing when you have a, a, a public uh, organization 
which is somehow or other existing in a sea of mm -hmm. private entrepreneurial capital, uh, which at some point or rather starts to prey upon uh, that as, as a kind of turn it into a victim of its of its own, own designs. So let your utopian visions run riot before we close. You're one who talks about our utopian desires and how we need to express them. Um, express them. <laughs> well, I think for one of them is uh, you know abolish the exchange value structures. Uh, and uh, of course, exchange value also rests on something called money. And money uh, is uh, a great corrupter, as we know, of, uh, of, of our desires and our needs. I mean, and, and we spend a lot of time worrying about money, desiring money, wanting money, and then you think to yourself, this is stupid. You know, this is not a good life, you know, to be kind of fetishistically sort of focusing on how much of this money I can, I, I mean, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we, we, we then have to have a, uh, you know, as Thomas More and Utopia suggested, a moneyless economy. And he then said, in a moneyless economy, you would sleep very well at night. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't sleep very well at night, so I'm looking forward to a moneyless economy where we can all sleep very well at night. <laughs> all right, well, we'll sleep at night wondering how the heck we will ever get there when yes. our Right. Politicians are in hock to the bankers. Yes, right. No, well, this is this is one of the big uh, things. Well, there's a lots of, lots of interesting things happening technologically now with money. I mean, electronic monies are beginning to, I think, uh, erode the traditional monetary forms. So we're going to see uh, a revolution in our monetary con configuration uh, coming down the pike. And one of the things I try to say to people on the left is. You've got to understand this is happening. We've got to make sure this is not orchestrated as a, as a right-wing uh, gesture, as happens with something like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there a way in which we on the left can actually construct an alternative monetary system, uh, which actually is much more democratic and which much more socially uh, constructive? Excellent. David Harvey, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. We came here to Palestine to stand in love and revolutionary struggle with our brothers and sisters. We come to a land that has been stolen by greed and destroyed by hate. We come here and we learn laws that have been co-signed in ink but written in the blood of the innocent. And we stand next to people who continue to courageously struggle and resist the occupation. People continue to dream and fight for freedom. From Ferguson to Palestine, the struggle for freedom continues. One, two, three, Until it's one, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it's one. We sit in a sea of settlements while the sound of suffering sails lost in the listening as the voices of heartache hail. The power of presence, people as portals, passports to heaven. Here is a protest in the form of a prayer. God is in the holy water lining the lower lids of Ali's eyes. A tear, a river against a cheek, waiting in old Jerusalem, sitting 
On a leaning chair in the market, the lonely storyteller God. God is a woman holding a crying baby in her arms at a checkpoint in Ramallah, waiting at the gates like cattle. God, God is in the rubble, gnarled hands rinsing in an open fire, a journey of dreamers singing through empty streets in Bethlehem. We survive in the telling, unafraid we survive in the telling, we survive. Watan badun shab wa shab badun watan. We survive. What if occupation's a dream the Palestinians had? Grills underneath their teeth and they suddenly relapsed. Saw the ships at the bay of the West Bank shore. Woke up and the occupation existed no more. What if Zionism is the second coming of Christ? Destruction is the matrimony in sight, because if we are the Messiah, then God is not white. What if life is the afterlife and we already dead? The footage of the moment replayed in your head, looping over until you die for the second time. What if power influence your intelligence and mind? And those with the lesser are really the oppressors, but you still steal this land under that pressure. Free Palestine. Palestine to Ferguson in the occupation. Ferguson to Palestine, we fight to free our nations. Palestine to Ferguson in the occupation. When it comes to elections, there's the who of politics and there's the what of it. What do parties and politicians actually do to win support? While they're not brilliant at the first, the money media in the U.S. tend to be truly terrible at covering the latter. The historic election in Greece is a case in point. Read the U.S. press and you'd gather the following. Greece's new prime minister, Alexis Tsipras, is its youngest ever at 40. He's far left, leftist, a leftist political maverick, a tough talker, and charismatic. Syriza, the party he leads, is usually called radical, far left, extremist, or some mix of all of those. So what's it to you? As Public Radio's Market Report put it on the eve of the vote, quote, the potentially massive repercussions of this weekend's election in a small corner of Europe is one more risk for the world to worry about, close quote. So there you have it in a nutshell. Mad leftists win. Watch out. If you read a little deeper, you might get a bit more of a fuller picture. After five years of recession and cuts, 1.3 million Greeks, some 26% of the workforce are without a job. Wages are down by 38%, pensions by 45%. Almost a third of Greeks are living below the poverty line and have no health insurance. Running on a pledge to roll back spending cuts and renegotiate Greece's loans, Cyprus's victory is generally described as a protest vote or a vote against austerity, which it certainly was. But there's a bit more to it than that, and it's interesting. On the Laura Flanders show, we had a chance to talk with a member of Syriza's central committee, Yanis Bournos. Last year, he told us that it's not charismatic speeches from balconies that win support, it's concrete help. Cyrus has offered a good deal of that in the last few years. As we've reported in the past on the program, a solidarity movement has grown up in Greece during this crisis. It runs some 400 health clinics, cooperative kitchens, and what they call food solidarity centers. When the first Syriza members were elected to parliament in 2012, they voted to give 20% of their monthly salary to that movement. And as of this August, Bornos said that Syriza volunteers were participating in 150 networks of local solidarity, offering everything from free drugs to free legal advice. Left or right, effective leadership is important. But it's possible, just possible, that Greek voters were swayed less, less by one guy's charisma than by hundreds of volunteers with a daily presence in their neighborhood. If we looked at politics that way in this country, how would our parties rate? Maybe there's a reason U.S. media prefer to stick to the surface. Tell me what you think. Write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at grittv.org. And thanks.
This week on the show, local finance expert Michael Schumann. There are 7,500 mutual funds in the United States, and not a single one invests a penny in local small business. And meet a group that is funding its own startup without deep pockets or Wall Street. We have all this, this, this melting pot of people, but if we could just blend together and work together, that becomes a great political power. We've got to have a new way of doing politics, yep, yep. Uh, and I think it's a time for invention yep. uh, and experimentation. And of course, experimentation means you often get things wrong, uh, but we've got to go out there and I think really push. And embrace that notion that there will be failure. Yes. Uh, say that, you know, you can't move forward without that. What would a different economy look like? One example is the worker-owned cooperative. We spoke to worker owners from around the world to hear about their experiences in starting these cooperatives.